Hey everyone, CJ here. After doing an episode on the 2000 years evolution of the wuxia genre in China, this time I'm going to talk about the evolution of ninja literature in Japan. In line with the theme of this video, I will also reveal a secret, a hidden subtext in ninja-related fiction that is often missed in the West. Ah, ninjas. The black-clad, back-flipping hidden specter that is hiding inside your closet right now is a familiar fictional figure in both the East and the West. In America, the image of the ninja is often quite different to what they have in Japan. Usually, Japanese ninjas don't run around in black suits in broad daylight to make themselves even more conspicuous. And neither do they see a large amount of enemies to be a great opportunity to introduce themselves. But then again, the image of ninja as a secretive assassin lurking in the shadows had not remained constant through Japanese history itself. That image had evolved through centuries, and even the name ninja is relatively new. It only started to be used around the 1950s and 60s, influenced by the post-war ninja popular media boom. Previously, they were called Shinobi no Mono or Ninjutsu Tsukai, which means ninjutsu user. But the name Shinobi itself was mainly used in the Warring Sengoku period and the peaceful Edo period that followed. And according to the three major sources of ninja information we have today, Pansen Shukai, Nimbiden, and Shoninki, there used to be many different names for different group of people who engage in activities that could be considered as Shinobi work. Depending on the time period and region, they used different names like Rappa, Supa and Mitsumono, which were used by Sengoku Shugo, Tageda Shingen, and Kyodan, which was used by Nobunaga. It seems that each of these different names may have represented a more specialized functions. But since spy work was categorized under ninjutsu during the late Sengoku and Edo period, they are anachronistically considered to be Shinobi no Mono by later writers. Nimpi Den, or Shinobi Hiden, was purportedly written by Hattori Hanzo, the father of the Hattori Hanzo who served Tokugawa Ieyasu. Yeah, Hattori Hanzo was a name inherited by the head of their clan, so it can get confusing sometimes. Among the three, Pansen Shukai is the book with the most comprehensive information on the shinobi, and there are two versions of it, the Koga version and the Iga version. Koga and Iga were famous historically documented ninja clans that are often featured in ninja fictions too. They are often depicted as rivals in stories, but historically, they may not have been that big of a rival, and the clans may even have intermarried. The version of Pansen Shukai that you commonly find is the Koka version. Shoninki was written just a few years after Pansen Shukai, and it describes the strategy of the shinobis from Kishu, which is part of the Wakayama prefecture today. All these documents claim that the ninja had Chinese origin, and the ancient Chinese name for shinobi is Jiantie. Pansen Shukai even went as far as to claim that the precursor of ninjutsu was invented during the time of Fuxi and the Yellow Emperor, the mythical and legendary kings of China from around 4 to 5,000 years ago. It is based on the espionage principles of Sun Tzu, the author of the art of war. Then it was passed down to Zhang Liang and Han Xin, the strategists and generals who helped Liu Bang establish the Han Dynasty, and so on. Oh ho ho, jotto mate, buddy! If you have any knowledge in Chinese history, you would immediately know that this claim of pedigree feels kind of spurious. Because Jian Die literally just means spy in Chinese. It feels like the compiler of this book, Fujibayashi Yasutake, was just dropping names to make the book sound legit. But it was overdone, and he achieved the opposite. The Western equivalent of this is like someone is saying that he had written a book on a method of government called omnicracy and it was developed during the time of Socrates when it was called democracy. Later, it was expanded on by George Washington and passed down to Abe Lincoln. You just can't take all the historical claims in this book seriously. But this is not an uncommon thing in ancient Japan because for a long time, they considered China to be a land of magic and exoticism. The Japanese thought of themselves as the mundane and normal one, and all the weird and magical stuff came from China. So that's why there are a lot of interesting folk tales in Japan that involve China. According to Japanese legend, Yang Guifei, the legendary beauty from Tang Dynasty China, faked her execution and sailed to Japan. And according to a legend from Akita Prefecture, 
the Namahake demon were brought there by the Han Dynasty Emperor Han Wu Di to find the elixir of immortality. In case you are wondering, no, Han Wu Di never went to Japan. Additionally, during the Sengoku period, Confucian education and Sun Tzu's art of war were very popular. The warlord Takeda Shingen's battle standard, Furin Kazan, was even based on Sun Tzu's principle of army movement. In Edo period, Neo-Confucianism became the national philosophy too. So Fujibayashi Yasutake may be drawing on the fame on Chinese legendary figures for credibility. And it does seem like he was a very educated person. Because in the book, he also quoted philosophers like Confucius and Lao Tzu. In China, there are a lot of ancient manuals that discuss the use and deployments of spies and counter-spies. However, I have never seen any that goes into the practical side of espionage and discuss what tools should be used. So it is likely that the shinobi's Chinese connection was just made up to exoticize the espionage profession. Perhaps it sounded better to them than claiming that it was just a technique created by low-class nobodies. Frankly, espionage and clandestine operations existed in practically every civilization that had waged war. Even in Japan, during the Yamato period, Prince Yamato Takeru was recorded to have disguised himself as a woman and assassinated his enemies. Spying in Japan was recorded as far back as Prince Shotoku's time, and espionage was already openly used during the Genpei War. It was only during the Sengoku and Edo period that the various espionage skills were grouped together and called Shinobi no Jutsu. And in Ninpi then, it was claimed that the clans of Iga and Koga practiced ninjutsu. What is written in these three ninja books were really just a collection of practical instructions on how to hide in public and use shinobi tools too. Shinobis did not have supernatural powers. At most, they used divination to pick an auspicious date to execute their plan. However, during the peaceful Edo period, the legend of ninja characters soon exploded thanks to the traditional Japanese storytelling art form of Kodan and Kabuki plays. What's interesting here is that, in the art form of the elites such as No Plays, there is hardly any shinobi characters featured. Even in Gunki, war record stories, shinobis were only mentioned in passing as side characters. Kodan was originally performed by samurais for the elites and the theme were Buddhist or war stories. But as more samurais became unemployed ronins during the Edo period, some of them started to perform in the public for the masses. It was only in later Kodan performances such as Sanada's Ten Braves we get ninja major characters like Sarutobi Sasuke. This story was based on the famous samurai Sanada Yukimura. Historically, he was not assisted by ninjas during the siege of Osaka. But after a few different iterations, 10 shinobi characters were added and it became its own story. And the most famous shinobi among the 10 was Sarutobi Sasuke. He is also the reason why there are a lot of ninjas named Sasuke in fiction. Then other shinobi figures also became popular in the Edo period, such as Ishikawa Goemon, which was loosely based on a historical person and Jiraiya, which is fictional but based on another story from Song Dynasty China. As ninja stories were performed in the lower class form of entertainment, such as the Kabuki Theater, shinobis became the heroes of the lower classes. And it is not a surprise since many of them were also historically drawn from the lower classes. Through various retellings, shinobis were given supernatural powers, likely because they are intended to entertain the less educated masses. Jiraiya, for example, had the famous ability to shapeshift into a toad. He also became the subject of the first special effects film in Japan. Ninjas had remained a popular subject since the Edo period. But the next big developments of ninja fiction only happened in post-war Japan in the 1950s and 60s. The big drivers of ninja fictions were the various novel authors. Two of the most iconic ones from this period were Shiba Ryotaro and Yamada Futaro. These two authors were tremendously influential. Shiba Ryotaro's work are usually more serious, and it is often adapted as period dramas or jiragegi. His debut novel, Owl Castle, was adapted numerous times, and his other historical fiction books that don't feature ninjas were also often adapted by NHK, the national TV network. So he is pretty much the clean and orthodox storyteller, and his ninjas have relatively more grounded abilities. 
Yamada Futaro, on the other hand, was the bad boy. His stories contained a lot of violence, sleaze, and bizarre supernatural ninja abilities. Practically everything, even magic, was called Nimpo in his stories. So that's why there is a different connotation for Nimpo and Ninjutsu in Japanese popular media. Nimpo became a more magical ninja skill, while Ninjutsu is more mundane. But historically, they mean the same thing, just espionage techniques. He pretty much invented the battle royale trope, and his ninja fights were like Jojo battles. He was quite the pioneer, and his works had more influence on manga and anime than his straight-laced counterpart. If you are interested in anime and manga, then you should check out his work. Then you will see how much he influenced the manga and anime industry. Another very influential creator of ninja fiction was the recently deceased mangaka Sanpei Shirato. He started creating independent manga in the late 50s and had been creating some ninja mangas in 1957. But it was his 1964 work, Kamui Den, that really took off. Due to his leftist philosophy, this manga became a platform of his social commentary, and he depicted his hero, Kamui, as the defender of the oppressed and the lower class. Since the ninja boom of the 60s onwards, you can see plenty of work featuring ninjas in movies, puppet shows, TV series, anime series, and even tokusatsu special effects series. The ninja theme had eventually become so overused, it has now become a flavor instead of the main content. Even the jumpsuit-wearing Naruto don't look more outlandish than the mecha-driving ninjas from Tobigage. With this oversaturation, the ninja's role as the hero of the lower class had become largely forgotten. Maybe because they are no longer needed, since Japan had one of the lowest wealth inequality rating among developed nations. But how do you feel about this? Do you think that the idea of ninjas as the hero of the lower class had become irrelevant? Comment and tell us what you think. Anyway, if you like this kind of cool history slash literature content, then be sure to subscribe to the channel, because I'm going to explain the cultivation trope next in terms of Brandon Sanderson's magic system. Before I go, I would also like to thank all our patrons on Patreon for supporting this channel. Until next time, stay cool my bros!